Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Computer Wednesday, we're going to talk about FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Arrays. So let's dive right into it. Now, what exactly is the need for something this fancy? Well, the reality is sometimes you want a hardware that can be programmed because here's the deal. Why software can do almost anything and you can configure it to do almost everything. It's not actually good at anything because that's the consequence of it. If you want to do everything, you end up in a scenario where you cannot do anything properly or efficiently. So, so <clears throat> if you have a scenario where you need something fast and efficient, for example, uh, let's say a module that is decoding image uh, data directly coming from the sensor. It's an extensive task, meaning many times we do not understand how heavy a video uh, pipeline could be if you completely decompress it. Like to give you a context, you're talking about 40-50 gigabytes per second from HDMI cable. So it is intensive. So many scenarios you need something that is fast and efficient. Now fast, it does make sense. You have to deal with a lot of data. Efficient simply because if it's battery powered, you do not have the luxury, oh, I'm going to run a thread ripper to decode this. Yeah, thread ripper can do it. It's just like like, yeah, you're, you're gonna need a generator to power that puppy. So if many times you have a requirement that is like, this should be fast and this should be efficient, FPGAs do play a very critical role. Now, ASICs uh, are the ultimate aim. ASICs are application specific integrated circuit, meaning this puppy is built to do one thing and it does that one thing amazingly. Meaning if you take your Snapdragon and you go boom on it, and then you will find there are units that are specifically built to do specific tasks and they are doing it extremely well. For example, uh, units that are designed for image processing. That's an ASIC. That's like, I'm gonna do the best image processing at the least amount of energy. To give you a context, if you try to do background removal on your USB fo uh, footage coming from a normal webcam, your processor is gonna die. If you try to do that on uh, basically Snapdragon's image processing, it's like, bro, I got this. Why? Because it's built to do one thing and one thing very efficiently. So ASICs are the ultimate end, but many times you do not have that luxury of just going with uh, ASICs simply because it requires bulk ordering, meaning you can make ASIC. This is, that's how almost every camera company works. Almost every high-end equipment works. Many times they do not have like, you know, general purpose uh, CPUs in them, like Raspberry Pis or things of that nature, ARM units or things of that nature. They have uh, basically, ASICs but consequence of that is ASICs is something that you have to bulk order by millions so and not to mention starting cost is also ludicrously high so this is uh, out of the question for many scenarios especially if you are prototyping you're like yeah I'm gonna model this they're gonna like dude we're not gonna give you one whole silicon wafer just so you can try one times it's not gonna work like that so fundamentally many times ASICs are out of the question and maybe it's just too niche you know for a fact that you only gonna sell let's say 10,000 unit of these is not good enough or you're just experimenting you just want to figure things out like which is the best way ASIC may be out of the question. Now, ASICs excel in one thing very particularly well, and that is things that need parallel processing. For example, whenever you are talking about microcontroller, it already has a pre-configured architecture to it. It, uh, it has things that is pre-built, pre-determined into this puppy. And it may have limitations. For example, let's say you're talking about microcontroller and like, hey, I need, a, let's say, eight, uh, you know, pulse width modulation pin. You may find, hey, normal Arduino only has four. You're like, what the hell? Again, it does have the pin, but it's inherently designed in such a way. The design is pre-built. Now you may be like, hey, can I do that with CPU? Absolutely. But then again, you hit up with the same consequence of fast and efficient. Now you may be like, hey, processor is like three gigahertz, but because it has so many stuff that it has to crunch through before it does even a normal thing, it ends up being very, very high latency. It's like fundamentally, uh, that's why you do not run your games on like, you know, CPU. Again, it, it can do that. It can do almost everything. That's why we use CPU for rendering, but uh, it has limitations where you like to just just give it to a GPU. So same happens here. Basically, many times you need something that is parallel processing. For example, let's say camera image sensor is taking the image. It could have a scenario where it's like, hey, I'm going to take black and white image. I'm going to decode it into color image, basically debating it. And then I'm going to send a let's say, two parallel data uh, output of it. One would be, let's say, 8-bit for proxy file saving. Another could be like, you know, uh, let's say 12-bit for raw recording. So again, all those things can be done on process, but it will be not in real time. It will be too goddamn slow. All of those things cannot be done in microcontroller because again, microcontrollers are generally too generic they are built for that uh, but FPGA is a good route now at the end once you are like a company like Sony or Canon or things of that nature you're gonna order your custom ASICs but again how the heck you reach to that level you have to go through FPGA again you can directly draw and uh, do that but that would be idiotically expensive and uh, many times many times even a small bit of overhead costs you a lot especially in real-time application for example audio equipment they are very serious about latency it's like da shall not have latency but how the heck you deal with latency if your processor itself has to do 10,000 things or microcontroller itself has to do a lot of things so in those sort of scenario fpga makes perfect sense
Now, this is a specific type of tool that hit kind of market around in 1980s. Earlier, FPGAs were used to, like this. Now, back in that days, it was very simple gates. Now, gates were, uh, well, fundamental building blocks of every IC that you see, be it CPU, be it GPU, be it whatever you see, is generally built from gates. Now, gates are arranged in specific orders. Those make, uh, like, you know, AND gate, OR gate, addition, subtraction, everything on a fundamental binary level is done by gates. Now, there are some gates that if you are very clever with it, you can tweak them, meaning they can go from uh, doing A, to going B. So that means you can configure them on a hardware level, meaning this hardware on a while it's working on its clock cycle, it can do, uh, let's say addition or it can do subtraction. You can divide that. Now do that on, let's say 5,000 gates. Now you have a custom unit that can do anything on a hardware level. Now imagine uh, in 1987, you can do that with 10,000 gates. Now we are talking something serious power, meaning that's low, again, that's not very high end power, but back in that day, that's like, that's a GG, that's almost like Apollo computer level power. And you can do, uh, you know, low level things, basically routing data packets and things of that nature. And if you have to reconfigure it, and if you have to redesign it for efficiency, you can do that. 10,000 gates are good. And then you come to 1992, at that point you are reaching 600k. Now you'll be surprised that 600k does not sound huge. And it is absolutely true. Back in uh, same time, same time if you looked at uh, basically CPUs, general purpose CPUs, they are much ahead because the design is pre-built. Everything about the CPU is predetermined. That's why we call it architectures, basically x86 architecture or uh, risk 5 architectures. Those are prefixed. They have a, like a design, like this is how you should design it. And then software solves all the, uh, you know, things. But when you are dealing with hardware, you have to design that is like, you know, you are giving a toolbox rather than a specific tool. Consequence, it's much bigger, much bulkier. So limitations are because of interconnect. So number is not that high. However, again, it's a bit behind uh, basically uh, dedicated CPUs, but it still started to catch up. Early 2000, we started to cross million mark. And in 2013, now it's starting to reach some huge Huge puppies, these puppies can go up to 50 million reconfigurable units. That is awesome amount of power. That's like, if you know what you're doing, 50 million units, that's like, I got this, I got this. Like that is so much that if you know what you're doing, you can actually run a direct raw decoding of an 8K sensor. So it does work. However, it is not as fast as ASIC. It's like a, if CPU is here, ASIC is here, FPGA is right in between. Again, it will be faster, more efficient, more real-time compared to a CPU, but it will not be as kick-ass as an ASIC. Again, ASIC does have a consequence that you have to know everything about your workload before you order it to them. And again, if you mess up, which does happen, you will be surprised how often that happens. If you mess up, you're like, yeah, whole batch has to be scrapped. You have to root it again. However, if you mess up the code that goes into FPGA, you can reflash this puppy. That's the whole point of programmable hardware comes in. And again, many times you may want to reprogram for other reasons also. For example, let's say you found a security vulnerability. You want to be like, hey, uh, what? how about instead of using this sort of routing method for my data packets, I change the route around from this. That could give you more security advantages and people do that. So, but be aware, like this is one step below A6 in it, but it is very quick to prototype because this, how the heck this puppy is working is just a software code away. So if you have a puppy who can properly program these things, you're going to do amazing work. To give you an example, I have provided an actual video down below. Please do watch it, like how people program it. Again, the programming example is a very small PWM signal generator, but you get that point. Like again, every uh, CPU, all that it does is like just addition, subtractions and binary stuff, which if you know how exactly those things work, what kind of brain do you have? And again, same thing, FPGA can do that. It's just much more efficient, much more parallelized. And again, you can do fancy things where it's like data is being processed while it's going through the system rather than like, you know, oh, going into shift register, then going to cache memory, then re crunching. No, because the pipeline is designed by you. You can design it's like do 10,000 crunching into this, what we call pipelining. Basically, CPU can only pipeline few things uh, like how M1 processors are so efficient because they are very good at pipelining. This puppy will be like, bro, move aside. So how does this magic hardware work? Well, again, it does require its own custom language, which we classify as hardware description language. It's not C++. Now people are trying to make sure hardware description language looks more like C++ so people can actually program it. And not to mention modern uh, FPGAs are huge as like physically huge. And the amount of gates and the amount of configurations they can have is bonkers. So uh, language does have to adapt to it so it can utilize it properly. So HDL is the main branch of science that we classify as like this puppy is dealing with FPGAs. There are generally two language inside it. Now, what you are actually configuring is what we call CLBs. Now, these CLBs are units something like this. Now, it looks complicated because it is complicated. And all it does is like you take input from A, B, C, D, and you have output. Now, depending on what you want this puppy to do, you can have it like, hey, if A and B is uh, like, you know, one, one, then give a zero output. Or if it's like C, A, D is one, give zero output. You can configure it however uh, you want it to. 
and all of these units are parallelized like uh, basically depending on how many units are inside your fpgas now block units are the main workhorse basically how much oomph your system has is directly defined by how many block units have now till so far it's almost like a normal computer however what makes them separate from a normal processor or microcontroller is the interconnects and there is a saying in the fpga industry is that you are not paying for the four blocks you are basically paying for the uh, basically interconnects and that's the limitation of fpgas because it's inherently built in such a way that this puppy can communicate to this puppy this puppy can communicate to this puppy the interconnects are inherently longer and slower because it's not optimized and if you know anything about modern processor everything is about latency I mean, like, how the heck you think the Ryzen became so good? Because they worked their ass off to make sure the cash flows efficiently. Yeah, you know, again, uh, right now we are not in a position where it's like, you know, we are reaching the silicon limit where you cannot make it any smaller. That's not an issue. Um, our main issue is like, how the heck you transmit signal efficiently enough? Meaning, how the heck you transmit data from one side of the processor to another side? That's how efficient. But again, if you have roads like this, it's inherently latency uh, that you are adding. Like data going from here to here. Again, if it was ASIC, you will design it like every data that is like physically close to each other. And yes, even at electron speed, it does matter. It does take time. You really want to shave off latency, you have to put like L2 directly uh, above L3 and L1 directly above L2. And again, people do try to do that. If you look at into any diagram of like, you know, block diagrams of uh, CPUs, you will pay attention like how where they are placing every equipment is very th carefully thought out to reduce latency. Now, interconnects here does allow you to configure whatever the hell, however the hell you want to do it, but it does come with the penalty of latency. That's why ASICs can pitch slap this puppy. Then you have I.O. blocks, basically input and output systems. Then you have block RAM because again, even though you can crunch a lot of things at the same time, you may not want to. You may be like, hey, wait for less specifically for there's a noise cancellation. You may want some data to be stored in a RAM. You have block RAM. You have digital signal processing unit because more the offering or not, you need DSP. So instead of configuring these rare units into DSP, people figured out, hey, it would be just efficient if we put DSP because you're gonna use it one way or the other, just add it. Then you have fixed function logic blocks. They're like, again, this thing goes complex. Basically, this makes a uh, programming look like a, uh, you know, child's play. Yeah, I have tried a video under if you dare to look into it. So, and nowadays people are now adding ASICs inside it. Now you're like, wait a minute, why the heck you will add ASIC inside of FPGA? FPGA is supposed to be flexible. And why the heck you are putting something that is locked? Well, reality is in the end, like at the end, it's a product that you are selling to people. If a lot of people are like, dude, we all of us, like every 98% um, of your customer is like, dude, we need something that addresses memory. For example, let's say RAM module externally uh, or something that directly talks to NVMe protocol. You're gonna be like, hey, instead of wasting these rare things and you know creating complex interconnects, I'm gonna give you a small module that's only job is just to directly do your NVMe stuff. So that way, if every customer needs it, it's like we do not need to reconfigure it, we do not need to write it, and it will be more efficient because you are not going through interconnects route. You will be having a dedicated pathway. It's like you know, process the data, send it to NV and uh, NVMe bridge, and bridge is like I got this. So that's why now uh, modern FPGAs have lot of ASIC units, meaning it may have things pre-built into it. And all you have to do is reconfigure other things that you want to do. Meaning, for example, if you are buying a processor FPGA that are specifically targeted for uh, camera industry, it will have almost everything for the output side. Input side, you go YOLO on it. You can have like, hey, I, I want a processor that is like, you know, very high crunchy, so you can make it into, let's say, Phantom. Or you could be like, you know, hey, I want 8K broadcast, but again, debearing at that a resolution is bonkers. So you're gonna have three sensors, RGB sensors, and then you can have that, okay? But all the companies who are using it, they gonna need a final video output. So they are like ASIC will be there. That is gonna do the final video encoding. How do you read the sensor? How do you process the sensor? That's up to you. Color coding, uh, binary bit uh, mapping, all that just lot lookup tables and all that. You do you. But after that, you're gonna need it. So we're gonna integrate it in the hardware itself. It's basically a good compromise between having everything done manually to like, you know, some things we know you're gonna need. So we're gonna optimize that. So what are the use of this puppy? Well, it's a cheaper uh, alternate to low volume production, meaning if you are like Sony and you're gonna like, hey, we're gonna launch a, a new camera model and we're gonna have like 5 million units of it, it makes sense for them to go to, let's say, their Sony semiconductor division. It's like, hey, can you make a, this XP, uh, X6 processor or something like that? Or same with Nikon or same with any other company, Canon also. So in low uh, volume production, it does not make sense. You cannot be like, hey, I'm a small company like Kronos, and I'm gonna make a high-speed camera that directly competes with, let's say, Phantom. If you go to a, a company that's like, hey, I want an ASIC, uh, they're gonna be like, okay, fine. Pre-book for $1 billion. You're like, yeah, no, no. Many people are like, just, no. 
but again because fpgas are mass produced already and again uh, people who are making uh, fpgas they don't care why how you use it they are just making it they are like all they want is to sell millions of that so they make millions of that it's pre built it's pre in market you can just buy that and use it will it be as efficient as asic no will it be much better than using any cpu and overheads absolutely will it allow you to run on battery power definitely so that's how people develop things so basically low volume products really benefit of it uh, from it and high end audio and video equipments are like prime suspect of it as as i specified basically 8k cameras that was used for broadcasting olympics yeah good luck trying to develop a basically complete pipeline for that again it can be done and again snapdragon is doing that but it's expensive and not to mention not to broadcast quality so and audio equipments audio equipments are very latency sensitive so they cannot use cpus they have to use uh, a basically FPGAs because again ASICs are way too uh, you know expensive and again if a company like uh, Zoom or something like that how many audio equipments they're gonna sell not that much so fundamentally they have a you know volume order issue then we come to video equipments again pro end one I'm not talking about like cons consumer equipment that you have in your mobile phone or basic DSLRs but pro end one that are like you know that you cannot even buy that's like uh, for example Ari has a very huge camera that is Ari LX large format and that is like 65 millimeter I'm pretty sure it has multiple ASICs inside that. Um, Basically, I'm saying basically multiple uh, FPGAs unit inside because otherwise there is no other equipment that can read that. Right now, there is no mass production sensor that uh, processor that you can buy. Hey, can you give me this processor that reads 8K sensor? It's like, no. So in those sort of settings, you get that point. Like if you have something that does have the advantage of being more expensive, you can use this puppy. Wireless networking backbone because right now there is a lot of issues with uh, 5G. Again, 5G itself is new. So meaning even if you have the money, let's say you are Siemens, you have the boatload of money that is needed to making 5G equipment. Awesome. But here's the deal, you're still gonna take time. You're still like, you, once you design your system, it still takes, could take upwards of a year before it's delivered to you. And again, final testing and packaging and delivering, it could take almost two years before you have something from an idea to actual hardware. FPGA can cut that down, down to like, you know, few months. And again, if you are dealing with uh, legal issues and when you have to switch the bandwidth, again, if you have uh, ASICs, it does work, but it's use and throw. If it does anything other than what it's supposed to do, it's not gonna work, while FPGA can be reprogrammed. So networking backbone, especially in 5G, they are using a lot of it. Cutting edge technology, for example, for common consumer, G-Sync is a very good example. When G-Sync uh, was launched, again, co the companies that were making the monitor, they were in a tough spot. Where it's like, yeah, we cut the spec sheet from uh, NVIDIA. This is what you're supposed to build. Okay, awesome. But we built it. We ordered it. Now it's going to take almost two years from uh, our point of view to reach to the audience. But how the heck, in meantime, we sell our product. They created a FPGA unit that was funded to a monitor. Again, it's not supposed to happen like this, but there was no other option that can give you them like the quick turnaround time. Because this is for prototyping. This is not how supposed to, your final product is supposed to be. This is like for prototyping. But they used it. It's like just sell it. And again, in many scenarios, it just makes sense to use FPGA. Even for many advanced equipments, people are learning that FPGA makes more sense simply because any company that is making FPGA, they are, they are taking care of the mass production side. If you can program it well enough, it will be good enough. So people are using that. Aeronautics runs on it. Uh, automotive industry simply because think of this, let's say you are Toyota, how many times you're going to design a custom A6? It's far more efficient for you to just like, you know, figure out the best uh, FPGA vendor and then just go YOLO on it. Then you can configure it like, yeah, it's for diesel car, put that uh, diesel protocols into it. It's for fuel uh, LPG cars, put for that. So that's why automotive industry also loves that. And it's the base block that people use for ASIC prototyping, meaning once you're going to develop the G-Sync module, once you got this puppy down, then you're going to send the design to, hey, can you make the, like, you know, this puppy rather than interconnects, have an actual connections and then have prototyping. Uh, ASICs can be manufactured. And this company is a very good example of FPGA making something real world concrete that you can buy. And again, many times if you are a small startup, you too cannot even think of touching ASICs. But FPGAs are like buy it from the shelf. It's almost like Arduinos. And you can buy FPGA practice modules uh, online market without costing too much. So what we can expect in the future? Well, right now, because technology is moving so goddamn fast, is there is like a scenario where this technology, basically FPGAs are acting as a bridge, uh, bridge technology, meaning 5G deployed. Again, things are changing right now. So right now, nobody is want to invest into uh, ASICs, but FPGAs make sense. It's like if a government has a you know legal issue, you can change the frequencies. Things work, everything is awesome. And it's not suited for mass production, meaning if you are expecting to sell like millions of Snapdragon, it's not a desirable situation. However, many things are not made in millions. For example, high-end audio, video, video equipments, network backbones, these things are not in billions of them. For example, if you're talking about a server that has like, you know, optical interconnects that are like 100 gigabytes per second. How many interconnects are like that? Very few. 
again compared to normal you know ethernet connection so in those sort of scenario fpgas makes amazing sense and more and more companies are realizing that they are integrating asics inside fpga the reason for that is like more or less uh, if let's say you are uh, trying to deal with networking you gonna have some pre requisite requirement that this shall do this no matter what yeah, we have to do this one way or the another and again if that task that is like predetermined prefixed can be done by asics it's far more efficient it reduces latency it reduces trace complexity in, inside this puppy that makes it far more valuable as a complete product meaning uh, rather than programming every single little detail you're like hey dude we need to have like let's say nv me connection link that is pre-built into it then that's a uh, asic based so it's much more fast much more efficient and you only configure what else you need to do so it's very very awesome and this technology is what we classify as printer technology basically this is the easiest way to do good things easiest right now like uh, if you want to make your own custom camera this is the easiest way of doing it. right now you want to build your custom network switches this is the easiest way of doing it so it does work but again once the technology matures once you reach a point where billions of people are using this this no longer makes sense because at that point in time you are overpaying for the interconnects and you know the programmability that you're not going to use at that point in time it makes sense to go into a6 department so it's very suitable for many things that are like you know very burst kind of scenarios like boom new technology done go home in those sort of scenarios and ai is also developing a lot of interest into this simply because our brain is amazing and it does not consume too much power then how the heck our brain is amazing because it's a wetware meaning the hardware and software is not independent they are interconnected to it uh, so our mind can physically change based on our thought process like again okay, if you utilize your memory systems too much you will find this part of your brain to be different like literally it will look different in mri scans like our hardware literally changes a person that lies too much literally will have different uh, brain configuration like it's so stark like you can look into it as like whoa they are different again the output will look like again it will look the same but the hardware has changed inside ai needs something like that otherwise it's just you know running uh, stuff on stuff it's not that efficient but again if it's directly dealing with something like fpgs it can reconfigure it can learn and then it can reconfigure it's like hey dude uh, these blocks now that are like dedicated for audio processing i have this configuration let me see hmm, i think we can do better the change hey dude, 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 it went bad okay okay change it again again that doing physical hardware iteration gives it far more energy efficient use and far lower latency processing meaning uh, after a few iterations it could have amazing output processing so ai people are loving this puppy so it does allow a lot of evolution on technological level now it is uh, as a final product it's like a mid volume production tool meaning if you're only ordering like you know 10000 of these network switches then it makes sense if if you are only making expected to sell like you know 100000 or uh, at max uh, of uh, like you know your high speed camera then it makes sense it's not for mass production it's not for like you know the next big thing it's for things that are a hidden uh, from the public view basically the whole network infrastructure and it's for uh, people who are developing high end tools but it is really important and in uh, upcoming years the ai will love these things and any person who cracks this puppy properly with ai they're gonna have some horsepower so this was my presentation on uh, fpga units hopefully you have liked it learn from it in that case please click the like button share it amongst a friend that will help me a lot if you didn't like it didn't enjoy it i urge you to press dislike press it twice to show me extra disappointment please leave a comment because i do try to reply to all of them subscribe press the bell icon if you're free and as always thanks for watching